Uh, my name is Josh Bullock. I'm a PhD student at Kingston University, um, and the name of my paper was Reimagining the Secular, the Sunday Assembly, Belonging Without Believing. Uh, so my research was at the Conway Hall in London, which is, has a long history of, uh, as an ethical society. It's where the Sunday Assembly meets. So I conducted a 15-month ethnographic research study of that particular site, um, as well as meeting people there and conducting 35 semi-structured interviews, um, as well as attending lots of other events the Sunday Assembly do, uh, like the Article Club and the Wonder Club and their annual conference in Utrecht this year. So ethno uh, ethnographic research is essentially like a participant observation. Um, it makes perfect sense to do it at the Sunday Assembly uh, because rather than, I, I opted to use ethnographic research rather than surveys, for example, as I wanted to see what the Sunday Assembly was like. And by doing so, I got to meet people, I got to talk to people, and I could ask them um, more in-depth questions, especially during the semi-structured interviews, which were part of my ethnographic research, than I thought I would get out of just survey data. So it was a great chance to actually experience it. and. Um, go along to some of their events rather than just, you know, asking questions on, on a survey or a poll. Uh, so the Sunday Assembly describes itself as a, uh, a secular community. Um, it started in 2013 by two co-founders, uh, Sanderson Jones and Pippa Evans. Um, they wanted to take all the best aspects of church, as they put it, um, but create it in a, in a secular version. Uh, so they have uh, the way it's kind of structured is they'll have pop songs which people can sing along to, um, they'll have a kind of TED talk which will be like a theme talk in the week and then after, afterwards they'll meet for tea and cake uh, and have a chat. Uh, so it really depends on location. Um, the London one is quite an exception so it can get up to 500 people who attend. Uh, the London one's very energetic, there will be people singing along, there will be dance breaks, um, and then other ones I've visited, like uh, Guildford, for example, in Surrey, there will be a much smaller um, kind, of, kind of service, uh, and maybe 20 or 30 people attend, and, it'll, and uh, it gives you more of a chance to meet and talk to people at the smaller ones, I think. Uh, so from my ethnographic research, um, the London one tends to be quite a homo uh, homogenous group. Um, roughly it's about 60% women, 40% uh, men in the age range of 20s to 40s, um, tends to be white and, and middle class, um, although described as radically inclusive, so anybody can come along, it tends to be uh, this population. Uh, so the Sunday Assembly has had very quick success, um, considering it only started in 2013, uh, being having one in London, now there's 70 global franchise secular communities in eight different countries. Um, so considering it's only three years old, it's had very quick, um, very quick success. However, considering the number of people which attend, uh, so the London one can have up to 500, uh, but others might only have 20 or 30. Uh, so Monthly they have about 5,000 people attend, which isn't a massive proportion of numbers, but they're looking to grow. So hopefully it will be to finish my PhD and write up my findings on the Sunday Assembly. Uh, but I'm also particularly interested in why um, the Sunday Assembly, some, some Sunday Assemblies aren't working, for example in Paris and Berlin and Crystal Palace in South London, so why are these failing? as well as looking at the cultural differences. So what uh, attracts people to attend in America might be completely different to London. So these are some questions I hope to look at when I finish my research and my PhD. My name is Amanda Schutz. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Arizona. And the paper I presented is titled Pathways to Organized Non-Belief. I conducted interviews. I did 125 interviews with uh, non-believers who were involved to varying degrees with 
uh, non-religious organizations, and I did uh, participant observation among uh, organizations, uh, eight different organizations in Houston, Texas. And Houston is um, ended up being a really great case to do uh, my research because there are a lot of different non-religious organizations in Houston. And it appears that Houston is kind of in this Goldilocks zone between levels of high and low secularity. So um, the example I used was one of my interview respondents who uh, described being from Northern England. Uh, he says the UK is um, very accepting of, of atheism. It's not gonna raise any eyebrows. He didn't even identify as an atheist at the time. There was just no need to seek out an atheist organization. Later on, he moved to Huntsville, Alabama, and found you know religion is very prevalent here. Uh, there's a very hostile attitude toward non-belief. Um, he, the way he described it, uh, that community just didn't have the critical mass of atheists to um, to necessitate an, an organization. And he also felt like it wasn't necessarily safe to do that. Um, so in Houston, you have this place that's a big city, it's diverse, it's cosmopolitan, um, but at the same time, you are still in Texas. Uh, you're in Houston, which is um, predominantly evangelical Protestant. Um, you can, non-believers can be um, fairly confident that they may encounter religion in their everyday life. Um, and having kind of that outlet is really helpful for people. So um, yeah, in Houston, it's not, it's not too secular um, where there's no need for an organization like that, but it's also not too religious where you feel unsafe congregating with other non-believers. So I, I interviewed 125 people and the the demographic characteristics of, of that sample looks a lot like um, like the national population of secularists. Um, so mostly men, my sample is about 60% men, mostly white, um, also predominantly um, people from Christian backgrounds, so people who were socialized to some degree in a religious household, um, most frequently Protestant Christianity. Um, Baptist was pretty prevalent being in Texas. Um, but I also interviewed people from Mormon backgrounds, Jewish, Hindu, Jehovah's Witness, New Age. Um, so Houston being a, a really diverse city, um, I was able to take advantage of that and, and even interview quite a few um, people from racial backgrounds that are underrepresented, I think, in research on non-religion. Um, there's a prevalent uh, black um, atheist community in Houston. Um, there's also um, a lot of ex-Muslims, um, people coming from India, ex-Hindus. Um, so it, it was really just a, a a great place to be to kind of see the diversity that exists in this community. So people join for all kinds of reasons. Um, social is, is a big one. Um, people want to find uh, others that agree with them on, on big issues, issues that are important to them. Um, like I said, a lot of people found, especially people moving to Houston from maybe other areas of the country, you know, came there and found, oh wow, religion comes up a lot here. Um, I, you know, maybe I'll look into, you know, joining an atheist group just to be around people where I don't have to worry about, um, you know, this being an, an issue in conversation. Um, along those lines too, people are searching for community. So a lot of times people are coming from religious backgrounds who are raised in the church and really like that atmosphere, um, seeking out a secular community that maybe even to some degrees mimics the, the church structure um, can be really appealing for people. Um, intellectual reasons, people join groups to go to lectures about sometimes religion, but often um, 
conversations about science, history, philosophy, um, just a place to learn something new. And they find that, that these communities can be a good place to do that. Yeah, some people join for um, social or, or political reasons to coordinate with other people and um, maybe promote social or political causes that are important to them or, or actually go out and try to, to make changes in, in their communities. Um, for some people, being an atheist is not an important part of their identity. It's part of who they are, but they don't feel like they necessarily need to go out and find other atheists to congregate with. Um, they maybe have other aspects of their identity maybe are more important to them. Um, other people are just anti-organization in general, um, specifically anti-religious organizations, and they may see non-religious organizations as kind of being a little bit too similar to um, especially maybe that organization that they already left. Um, they kind of see, you know, I left religion, I left organized religion, why would I want to go out and join the non-religious equivalent of that? Um, some people have a fear of groupthink, that they may lose intellectual autonomy, so maybe they, they view um, kind of the non-religious community as being susceptible to dogma in the same way that maybe the religious community is. Um, and for other people, it's more um, just a matter of convenience. So it's not necessarily that they're uninterested in these types of events, but they're busy. They don't have time. They're, they're busy with work. They're busy with kids. Um, they live too far away from where the meetings are happening. So in Houston, you have uh, secular meetings taking place all over town, but Houston's also a huge city. I mean, it, it can take you an hour to get from one side to the other if traffic's clear. Um, so, so some of those more practical reasons people, people don't join. Well, some of the people that end up leaving leave for reasons that are similar to those who don't join to begin with. So they just get too busy. Um, they don't have time. They find that um, they don't like the organizational aspect to it. They try it. It's just not for them. Maybe it's too much like religion. Um, but for other people, there were more political reasons for leaving. Um, maybe they find that you know, sexism um, occurs in these groups just like any others. Um, they may encounter people whose political ideology is much different than, than their own. Um, there was one case, one of the groups, a, a prominent member of the group was accused of sexual harassment and people in the community were very upset with the way the leadership in that group dealt with the situation. They felt that there was a lot of victim blaming language going around. They felt like there should have been sanctions, but um, the leadership was more like, oh, this was just an unfortunate you know, thing that happened, and she was drinking, and it was a misunderstanding, and he's a good guy. Um, so people were, were pretty upset about that and, and left. So I think that people join these groups, a lot of people, so statistically uh, the majority of secularists are usually politically left-leaning um, and they may expect these groups to be, um, you know, these idealistic progressive utopias and then they go and they find out what's well, an organization. Um, it's susceptible to the same systematic institutionalized inequalities that, that other organizations are. Um, and so I think some people may become disillusioned by, by these instances that occur in the communities. So the Houston Black Nonbelievers is um, probably a humanist community, I would classify it, it as. Um, they basically what makes them different from, a, from say, the other humanist group in Houston is that they really prioritize the black experience. Um, that being black and being an atheist um, 
is kind of a special circumstance, that it may be more difficult for people who are black to come out and be accepted by their families and be accepted by their communities, uh, which tend to be much more religious than you know, typical white communities or families, perhaps. Um, and that's something that not all people in the community see the need for that. Um, or one, one of my interview respondents told me at a meeting once that he thought that there shouldn't be a black non-believers group, that um, we shouldn't be dividing people based on, on race, that they, you know, they're humanists, they should include everyone, we shouldn't be dividing the community, we should be bringing it together. Um, so that is one line of thought. The other line of thought is, again, that, that these experiences are are qualitatively significantly different from the experiences of the racial major majority. So I would say the, the biggest takeaway is that there's a lot of diversity in this community. Um, so as a sociologist, we look for trends and patterns. We look for commonalities that exist within social groups. But I think the diversity that exists in this community is, is really significant uh, because I think people tend to view atheists uh, as there's a, a perception that atheists are arrogant, uh, confrontational, angry, um, that they hate religion and hate religious people. This is a perception that exists within the atheist community too. Atheists also kind of buy into these um, these stereotypes, and this is another reason that people may av avoid these groups or decide not to join because they think, oh, why would I, why do I want to join this group? It's just going to be a bunch of you know angry white men, um, you know, arguing about religion and how terrible it is, and I'm just not interested in that. So yeah, there is this perception of what these groups are like, and that that perception does exist, that is an expression of, of atheism that exists, but it's not the majority. There's um, a lot of different groups out there, people have a lot of different reasons for joining, and I think by exposing that diversity, I think will alleviate some of those stereotypes and negative perceptions that exist about that group of people. I'm Katharina Pöls. Um, I'm right now in the research training group SOCLIFE at the University of Cologne. And my first paper is called Non-Religious Individuals Life Satisfaction, examining the role of belief certainty and context factors. Well, there's a really broad field of research on the relation between well-being and religiosity. And um, yeah, most research finds that the religious are basically advantaged concerning their well-being. Um, in general, that they are healthier, happier, or more satisfied in life, so both physical and psychological well-being. Um, but also specific factors such as the involvement in religious communities, um, specific beliefs or activities such as praying are related to higher levels of well-being. Um, yeah, the question is just compared to whom do those individuals have an advantage? Yeah, in general, um, there's the criticism that it's not clear what the opposite of, of religious individuals are. Um, can you really interpret that as the non-religious or the secular? Um, yeah, the criticism is you can't. Um, it's a mix up uh, of people who are weakly religious, who are uh, yeah, indifferent to religion, um, and also the non-religious. Um, and there's also no differentiation between types of non-religiosity. Um, maybe atheists um, have higher levels of well-being while agnostics don't, or yeah, all such differences are never explored. It's just one combined groups of all those different phenomena. 
Um, and also the main uh, research is done in the US, um, so there's no exploration about what different contacts, um, yeah, what an influence they have on those effects. Um, uh, there is um, some research that shows the importance of uh, social norms on that relation between religiosity and well-being, and that has not been yet explored for non-religiosity. Yes, um, usually there is the opposite, religious and non-religious, um, and that's compared to each other. Um, so now there's research, for example, by Galen and Claude, um, and they found that it's not so much the specific belief content, um, so what you believe in, but more how convinced you are of what you believe in. So um, that basically there's factors underlying your beliefs which are similar whether you're believing or not believing, and that those actually um, yeah, are the important thing that influences your well-being. In the case of certainty of belief, that would be that you have a clear and certain worldview, um, that you know what you believe in, and um, yeah, that the world is kind of organized to you, maybe you could say, um, that you have your outlook and you're certain on that, and it doesn't matter, matter whether there's religious content or secular, um, it both has an influence, a positive influence on your well-being, while in, con in contrast being um, insecure and doubtful has a negative influence. Yes, um, we did um, differentiate between types of non-religiosity um, in our research between atheists and other non-religious individuals. Um, and we also explored the role of context factors, um, which means we did an intercultural comparison um, across 31 countries worldwide um, and explored how these different levels of a social norm of non-religiosity has an influence. And the basic finding is um, that we can find that atheist and religious individuals have higher levels of life satisfaction than other non-religious individuals, um, and we interpret this, this as such a certainty of belief effect. Um, however, that was not independent of our control vari variables, uh, so socio-demographic characteristics. Um, if we included those, we found basically no difference um, between religious, atheist, and not religious individuals, um, which is contrary to all previous research. Um, we did also find that the difference between atheist and religious individuals' life satisfaction is lower in countries where there is a lot of other individuals that identify as atheist or non-religious. Um, and this is the effect of the social norm. Um, and that shows that it's um, not so important whether you are religious or not, but um, yeah, first of all, how, how, how secure you are in what you believe in, and also in what environment you live. Um, are you surrounded by like-minded people and feel maybe as part of a social group or, yeah, um, that such factors are a lot more important than rather that clear distinction between religious and non-religious individuals.